Winners match everybody, all direct pass, and I apologize for the drilling, I don't think it's my neighbor's wife that's getting drilled there, it seems more that it's the wall, that's the noise that's coming, maybe through my microphone, it's the, it's the evening on the weekend, I mean if you're drilling a wall like this, at least make it a weekday or something, so it's a bit bonkers, but unfortunately we kind of have to deal with it, so if you hear loud noises, you don't have to call the police or anything, there's no crime in progress, I'm fine, but yeah, something is definitely happening there. So I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but maybe they're getting frustrated because they bought some kind of IKEA furniture, trying to put it together, and it's just not working, and they're just unleashing all of their frustration on the wall. For the love of God! <laughs> <laughs> okay, now they're getting a little bit absurd with it. We are in a winner's match. This is the Banshee Cup playoffs, so yes, they picked a great time for that. Banshee Cup playoffs, everybody. We have bounties in the game now. I hope you can still hear me because it's bad. <laughs> the Bratwurst boys against Team Ash. Now the good news for the winner of this series is that they move on to the next round. Oh sorry, not to the next round, to the next phase of the playoffs. We're currently down to the top eight. We have uh, two groups with four teams each. And the top two out of each group make it into the playoffs where they play a double elimination uh, system uh, tournament style after that. Now, that being said, we also have, of course, now bounties that we introduced to the game. And I'm going to show those bounties to you once again. So it's a very simple system. These are all the bounties. Each team has their own bounty board. So if somebody completes a bounty, it's not completed for everybody. It's only completed for that specific team. And they cannot go for the same bounty again. Teams can also only try for a bounty once within the best of three or best of five series so you can't just complete the same bounty over and over and over again and you of course have to win so these are the ones that are available we already had quite a few bounties attempted and one team was able to complete one if you complete a bounty you make it happen then you get additional 50 dollars so the system incentivizes players to play with a bit of a handicap and they of course have to win with it uh, or you can just simply say, nah, we don't care about bounties. What we're going to do instead, we're gonna, just going to try for the tournament money, for the prize money, which is $2,000 that is split between the top four teams. So the total maximum prize money that we have for the tournament now, if each team takes as many bounties as they can, would be $3,600. So it's all up to the teams on what they want to do with all of this. Now we got Blaze, Tyrael and Tracer in the mix on all drag pass, our first member in the best of three series for the Bratwurst boys. I think the drilling's over, by the way. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Hogger and Muradin on the other side. Uh, could still go for uh, some kind of Warcraft comp, for an alliance comp, I suppose. But yeah, I, I, I gotta keep an eye on this a little bit. So obviously, you have to also pay attention if a team really attempts to go for one of these comps, or what exactly they're trying to do. But we had some real fun matches already, and I think a few of the teams went a little bit too deep when they decided on what bounty they want to go for. Valera as a pick has turned out to be horrible. I mean, who would have thought, considering that not even Meta Madness was she at any point played. And there's a Genji pick, so that already shuts down any kind of team comp that they could technically go for. But we have the Anduin Genji Light Bomb Engage. So at least for map number one, it currently seems like Team Ash is very much interested in just coming in there and showing the Bratwurst boys who's boss, locking in that 1-0. Uh, no support. Okay, they're not done yet. <laughs> and we get Malfurion. So it's the holy trinity of Tracer players. We get Tracer with Tyrael Shield and Malfurion Overheal. Really strong comp for game number one. I mean, that is a powerful one to lead things up with. Whereas uh, Team Ash has now the final pick for map number one in the best of three. And let's see what they're going to lock in. They still need a bit more damage. Genji alone is not going to cut it for them on all direct pass. So, what's the weapon of choice as they go up against the uh, favorite? It's Hanzo. They go for the Shimada brothers, they go for the duo. And we're heading straight into Autrek Pass. Game number one. Bradwurst boys on the left with Hazu on Blaze, Dino on Tracer, Masquerade on Tyrael, Ultralisk with Liming, and last but not least, we have Death Knight on Malfurion. 
Over on the right side of the map, their opponents, we're talking Team Ash, one of the most aggressive teams that we have in uh, the tournament. And, well, let's see what they can actually pull off here. This should be a fun one. So, right now we have them with Renella playing Anduin. We got Lopaka on Hanzo, Bishops on Muradin, Murenas on Hoga, and Mai Try on Genji. Good times. Shimada Brothers. The more Overwatch, the better seems to be the decision. They saw on the other side Trace and they were like, God damn it. How do we counter that Overwatch hero? And they came in with a very quick solution. They said, you know what? We're picking two Overwatch heroes. Two Overwatch heroes are clearly better than one Overwatch hero. And that's exactly what they went for. So, down to the bottom of the map, we have the side lanes being established. I mean, uh, in this case, it's actually Anduin plus Hanzo that are trying to make their play there. A little bit of a push also going on through the middle. Now that the one minute mark is approaching, the teams will start to set things up for their camp. We have Muradin actually with Perfect Storm as his level 1 talent choice here. So he's going to get that extra Storm Bolt damage out as well. Is in theory a pretty cool talent? I mean, if you are able to get a ton of damage with it and then you maybe even follow up with your level 4 talent, you can do a whole lot of work, particularly when you're, let's say, playing maps like Battlefield of Eternity. It can be kind of fun. But you're losing, of course, a lot of the sustainability. That he fat fingered. There's no way that was intended. So, yeah, at least it seemed like it. They also swapped roles a little bit. Bishops, in this case, is now playing, as you can tell, with Muradin. And at the front, uh, front line. Yeah, spray games on point as the teams are starting to make a couple of moves here. We have in the middle of the map, Death Knight against Ultralisk, still going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And Ultralisk has been playing with Liming a few times already, and he is absolutely devastating on that hero. I mean, damn, he's been going to town on some of them. We had him in the previous series where he, I believe, went straight in with a triple kill. So it was brutal, absolutely brutal. Now, either way, as we now have our winner's match here, we have still the favorite, blue team. Try oh, try to get first blood, and they do. I talked about Ultralisk a moment ago, and apparently this time the caster curse hasn't hit him. Instead, we see the quick kill, and that gives him a reset. Can't do a whole lot with it just yet, but he gets the kill and the reset regardless. So good moves by him, and first blood for the blue team. They are obviously a menace. I mean, they're really the team to beat. Down to the bottom of the map, Tracer now going up against my try. That's the only one that can at least uh, throw it back a little bit. But the first objective is now being uh, locked in, well, announced. Not locked in yet. We have the camps still being taken and they're also respawning. So the first camp was already claimed. Next one is already respawning as everybody is getting ready for this. Top side, Blaze, Retreats, Hazo. Saw that already coming from a mile away. That there is some damage coming towards him and yeah, he goes for the consequences. 11 stacks for Muradin. We're going to keep our eye on that as the game continues, of course. But, yeah. Just a little bit of early game skirmishes. We had the first kill, first blood. Besides that, not a lot going on. But they are apparently trying to... Yeah, Masquerade is dead. He was new, He was just trying to double check a little bit there. And he was like, yeah, let's see what we can do. Maybe we can go for a couple of cheeky moves there. And they just shut that down immediately. And now that Tyriel is dead, what they're trying to pull off instead is them moving on for the objective and at least get an advantage. And they lock it in. So they might not get the entire camp, but any kind of advantage that you can now get for your team is of course great. So Muradin is still sitting tight here, making his play and attempting to buy them as much time on objective number one as he possibly can. And this could just work out for them. Especially now that there's only 10 seconds left, there's a fight happening at the bottom of the map, but that also means, yeah, okay, they get one kill each, both of the supports are gone, but the objective is taken. The objective is taken. Hanzo dying is a bit of an issue because that means it makes it so much diff more difficult for you now to get value out of it, but they were able to claim both, so that's not too bad. Three kills against three. Raiders this early in the game, not that big of a deal yet, but they are going to do at least some work to these walls. The problem is they're losing way too many heroes in the process. Hogger is just pogging as much as he can, but now he finds himself completely on the wrong side. Ah, and he gets a kill! Okay, Morenas! Yeah, that's a lot better. I like it. Takes Ultralis down, has a spin to win again, and gets out. Adding insult to injury. Doesn't even... 
oh my god doesn't even have the uh, the niceness to die here so yeah unfortunate for ultralisk yeah apparently they're trying to torture the wall a bit more you know this was a pretty smart comment because i'm talking not only about team ash this is literally the wall to my room. They're just they're trying to break in. <laughs> they, they, they are just outside. <laughs> Honestly, if at some point I start screaming, then there's a drill coming through the wall because they're trying to attack me. <laughs> they're breaking in, I know it. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, not only walls and Heroes of the Storm are getting destroyed here. Apparently the walls in my apartment are also getting murdered. Uh, so yeah, experiencing this firsthand. This is real life Heroes of the Storm, real life Nexus plays. We, by the way, get into. Uh, oh my God! Beautiful play, beautiful. Ultra Lisk got ultra wrecked, and they're also getting Tyrael. Once they had level 10 abilities, they just shit all over them. Yeah, the blue team definitely needs a shower after this one, no matter how it ends, because damn. Look at this, such, such a great job. First Hanzo's arrow, then the follow up with Genji light bomb, just absolute textbook what they did there. And now they turned it. And I have to stress this again, this is the Bratwurst boys they're going up against, right? Hoga at least falls, but that boss will be taken. We are talking seven kills to five, and with the early level 10 ability, Team Ash unleashed. They absolutely unleashed. So now, with level 10 in their hands, the Bratwurst boys can of course start to bring this one back. But that was a perfect display of an advantage and what you can do with it. Taking the boss, getting the kills, making huge moves here and establishing a half level lead while destroying the first fort of the game. That went well. And now obviously on top of that we also have topside, another boss that they can take and they are already working on it so they're starting to make a play for this boss too which is probably going to cost them their mid fort now that I look at it because there's a camp coming in and on top of that they're also making the next move onto the structure so I guess they're trading forts now Hoga is not going to be able to stop this he was taking the camp it's a very very smart and pretty cool rotation from the blue team perfectly exploiting the position on the map the team rotates in the boss is now taken so yes that top fort will fall on the blue team side too but down here, my try. Yes, X strikes out in the nick of time to save his butt. Good for him. Arrow. Oh boy. Yeah, that's going straight to Mexico this time. They're aiming a little bit deeper. It's not going to go to NA. Nope. We're talking. Uh, we're talking south. But either way, by now we are looking at the top fort getting destroyed. We're also having uh, the minions come in, so somebody has to deal with this soon. Muradin has 36 stacks on his level 1 talent just yet. So he is increasing the storm ball damage, and they can start to chunk heroes down a little bit faster if he gets those hits in. And they're getting a kill against Tracer. Like, they're getting a lot right now. Team Ash is doing so much better against the Bratwurst boys here than I expected, to be honest with you. And it's working. They are at level 13. It's big and might get another objective and this time we're a bit later in the game so if you get an objective here this is going to carry a lot more water because now we are eight minutes in not insane nothing crazy but still strong enough to get you ahead on some structures so much better than what we saw previously from them so yeah let's see what they can do with this Meridian with 50 stacks now and this is also uh getting uh, bit more annoying when those storm bolts connect now don't get me wrong his damage output is not going to all of a sudden explode insanely but as long as he gets that storm bolt you know connected on the same target that everybody wants to make a move on there is a chance Hanzo's arrow yeah going all the way up north so that one's hitting Canada for sure but the save is there one second it's 1.2 seconds is what we're missing yeah, that was clutch. But Horga dies again. Uh, this is the second time that he falls. 13 on both sides. And there's still the camp in the middle that is pressuring for the mid game, uh, mid, uh, mid, game uh, mid lane fort keep. So, yeah. Uh, six kills to eight. One level. Difference between the two teams now. And they are still looking to get this one. Can Genji sneak it? He can literally just sneak it. And he does. They don't know he's there. They're winning it. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> My try. I love moves like this. The first time that I saw that on Aldrich Pass, it was so insanely funny because nobody really thought about it. 
and then the first one did it, it's like, wait a second, what? So, yeah, I love when that happens. You're so focused and you don't think about it that both can be channeled at the same time. Mirrodin is destroyed, so yes, he's down, but they have now started to do some damage down at the bottom of the map as well, in addition to all of this. And of course, them sneaking in the objective is also going to help them. Tyriel falls, shockwave, uh oh. Hoga trying to get out, Dino, low, recall in the bunker. <laughs> Tracer might still die, Malfurion sure does. And even Liming is low, so they might actually be able to go for the keep here. They shouldn't chase Dino too long. I mean, if they want to send one or two heroes to chase him down, like, fair enough, but I think they have a chance at the keep. So, them chasing Dino drops Tracer, but maybe it also eliminates their chance to take the keep down. And this one, with those heroes poking? I am not sure if that was really worth it. If they still can get the keep, then fine. There's also, at the top, another raider that is breaking through this, so yeah, they're giving the keep up, so the keep still falls. It would have been super annoying for them, I suppose, if the keep for some reason was saved by the blue team. Because chasing Dino, yes, it puts your opponent in a position where for a longer time they're going to be with four on the map. But you still want to get that keep. Still want to make that happen. So, yeah. Either way, 16 is in. That means we have the double pull now for Anduin. Again, kablooey! And the final cut. The anti-Dignitas talent. It's down at the bottom of the map. It is time to take some bosses out again. So yes, next play being made here. And, well, let's see. This boss is a freebie. Nobody is really dealing with it. Nobody is attacking anything. Nobody is going topside. I mean, obviously this one isn't even spawned yet, but it will soon, half a minute. They can't do a lot with this though. I don't think they can go core here. It's so risky to go core when there's only one armor shield removed, even with a boss. And even if you kill heroes now, great arrow. I don't think you can pull that off. The death timers are so low 11 minutes in, but well, actually 40 seconds? It's not much, but is that enough? It is such a risk to do that. I boy. I always, it's always tricky. It's always weird for me to try and, and pull it off teams have done it but it's a risk to take because it's a five versus four on the boss but if they play this properly then they take the lead in the series hoga is dead and oh i don't know just no 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 okay they're falling back but now they've lost a keep or they're losing a keep so them thinking that they can end the game here cost them a keep and also they wasted the advantage that they had because they could have gone topside, get a second boss, try for a second keep. Now they're even with the opponent's team. This is one of the big problems from all drag pass that even after all this time still teams are heavily misjudging what they can pull off against the core that has only one armor shield removed. So yeah, that's a big problem. 12 kills, 2, 8, 16 for both teams. We have 38,000 damage for Hanzo, and now Bratwurst boys are in a position where they can start to make a couple of plays themselves. They've lost all the forts, there's still two standing for Team Ash, but all you gotta do is win a single objective, and it's a totally different story. Tracer specifically had a bit of a problem, but yeah, this is tough. If it was a different map, then even when you have to back off, you are still able to at least, you know, get some damage in. But here, the map regenerates hit points, or the core regenerates hit points, and this is essentially the biggest problem. So, they walked away with nothing at the end of the day. Camp is taken, now we're going for the next objective, and the chance to maybe get this one, maybe make a play here. Well, Anduin is down, Genji is down, this is the Bratwurst boys, ladies! If you waste an opportunity like this, they are taking everything and more. Another great play from Ultralisk, four heroes taken down, they want to go middle. I doubt that they are going to go for the core, but hey, maybe. Maybe they can do what Team Ash didn't. So yeah, Muradin is trying to come in and slow them down. This is the same situation on the other side of the map. This is the same play right here. But Mirrodin is gone, that means no defenders. On the other side it was four defenders, here it's none, and that changes things drastically enough. So, yeah, no defenders left. Team Ash is going down in game number one. The Bratwurst boys with better judgment here. They take the core out. Anduin, even if he comes back, who cares? 
And that is game. 13 kills to 12. And we have a victory for the Bratwurst boys on all direct pass, taking the first map of the series. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet, so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Gun of Terror, map number two. The lead goes to the Bratwurst boys. A close call though. There was definitely a moment where Team Ash had the chance to get further and further ahead and control the game more, but they thought they could end. There were four defenders though, and that was just simply too much for them to handle. And then when the Bratwurst boys made their own play for the core, even though there were still two armor shields remaining, there was no defender left because the entire team got wiped, so that made all the difference, and they were able to win it. Now I talked a lot about the bounties again on the bounty board, and I'll show you once again what they are. Now a quick reminder, the Bratwurst boys already completed one bounty. They already played a series where they didn't have a healer. That's gone for them. Everybody else can still complete that, no problem. There's obviously still plenty of things to pick. My personal guess is that since they are in the lead, the Bratwurst boys are very likely to try again and get something done here. But just as a bit of a reminder, one is already gone for them. So they can't complete that anymore. Now, when it comes to draft, same rule applies. You can play anything but the heroes that were already played. So, 10 heroes are off the board. Again, best of 3 series, even the best of 5 series without pre-bans, like we have the meta matters that doesn't, doesn't have too much of an impact. So, you can still play very, very normal comps, so mostly. But, let's have a look on what the blue team is now picking here. Now, just a reminder, the team that wins moves on to the next phase of the tournament. The team that loses is playing another match, the consolation match. They play against the winner of the losers match. And, well, whoever wins there also advances. The loser drops out of the tournament. The top two out of each group uh, make it. And we're playing GSL style, group, uh, GSL style groups. So, Medivh banned out, and we're heading straight into first pick, which also means that Garden of Terror was, by the way, chosen by Team Ash. So, Team Ash decided that they want to play the map, and they don't care about having first pick, first ban. Abatha gets picked. <laughs> Again, monstrosity is a bounty, so there's a potential. I... <sighs> They've been playing the Samuro Abatha style so much. And they could do it again. Joanna and Sylvanas. I was thinking, like, can you take some, can you take some more away? Would you even want to? And now that you have the Bratwurst boys with an Abatha first pick, now they can go and pick some more if they want and play the same style again that they have done on multiple times. Put Ultralisk on Samuro, have Abatha on uh, Hazo, and that's exactly what they're doing. There's still the question mark of whether or not they're willing to go into Monstrosity instead of just supporting Samuro throughout all of this. But, yeah. It's already an annoying draft. I would hate going up against this. I've been advocating for it the entire time. I've been advocating for this particular comp for months, and I'm happy that teams are finally doing it. It's super fun to watch. But there's a lot of stuff that is really fun to watch when it happens to somebody else, but definitely not when it happens to you. And this is one of them. So, pick is coming in. And it is... An, ah, ban, sorry. A new Burak. So, yeah. A noob is in the house. So, good stuff. A band in the house. Yeah. Meridian was already played. Yeah, I mean, there's still plenty to go around at the front line where they can use Abatha as well and leverage him. I don't think they're going to be too worried about a new Barak. I'm also interested what the next pick is going to be that can help them also with camp clear, because that's going to be big. God of Terror has most of the mercenary camps in all the maps that we have in Heroes of the Storm. And if you continuously get them and get them quickly, you can do a ton. Dehaka wasn't played yet, right? So Dehaka is another one that could be chosen for Garden of Terror. It's big. You have, of course, with Dehaka, False there lots of globals you can use and try and control your opponent. <laughs> Stukov and Cassia! Leaves us with Morena, this is the final pick. I'm still a bit curious to see what Masquerade is going to play. With a different composition, I would say he's going for Stitches again. He played Stitches a few times in Garden of Terror, if I'm not completely misremembering things. 
But this is not really the comp where I see in play stitches. Normally you want more than Rhaegar's Totem to slow somebody down after the hook connects. And they also don't have too much burst damage just now. They could add Grey main, I guess. But there is May and Falstad. So we get the birdie. We have <laughs> Bird plus Abatha, Samuro plus Abatha. You can really control the map. I think they're going to play macro here. And if that's the case, then Abatha might go monstrosity. This might be one of the games where saying like, you know what, guys, we're going to just play macro. <laughs> and they use Illidan's against it. Illidan is in the house, not a bounty. And Garden of Terror is the map. Let's go, everybody. Bratwurst boys in game number two against Team Ash. Game number two. On the left, the Bratwurst boys with Samuro, played by Ultralisk. Death Knight is playing Rhaegar. We have Hazops on Abatha, Dainu on Falstad, and Masquerade is playing me. To the right side, Team Ash with Renella on Stukov, Morenas on Cassia. We got Maitri on Jojo, Lopaka on Illidan, and Bishops is playing Sylvanas. Awesome to see Illidan here. And again, there's currently no bounty attempted, but there is the chance that we're going to get Hazo Ops with the monstrosity on level 10. And I guess depending on how things go for them, they can play a fully macro-focused game and try to use the monstrosity in uh, that capacity. So we're going to watch out for level 10 abilities, but up to now, there's currently no direct bounty attempts by either one of the teams. Specifically, Team Ash, obviously, highly interested and just making sure that they are moving to game number three. They would love to avoid the consolation match. That's always never really a good spot when you are starting the day of strong and then you might still get, be out of the tournament. So, yeah. But for now, we got Thunderstroke as our level one talent for Cassia, which means that we're talking stacks again. They're already poking a little bit at the bottom of the map, as in the middle we have Abatha doing his thing now as well. And the attacks here keep coming, so Dainu is falling away. And Death Knight is getting pushed back out as well. But yeah, Masquerade with May can slow things down a little bit. Stay frosty, baby. And I want to see what Illidan does. Illidan is just fun to watch. It always has been. He is just murdering people. Talking about murdering people. The first one to get murdered is May. So May is gone. And yep, that's that. Same time now, the entire wall is destroyed. I mean, they are suffering in the early stages. Abatha cannot help them too much just yet, so they are exploiting this ruthlessly. Samora's up at the top against Illidan, and what we are seeing down at the bottom of the map is just attack, 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 and attack. So, yeah, that fort is fairly exposed. One minute mark has already passed, and nobody has moved on for camps, which we normally see happening right away. They are now starting to fall back on it. Bishops also getting good damage out, but might still be in trouble and is followed. So yeah, that definitely played out very differently in his mind. They are not getting a second kill, but taking Sylvanas down alone was already pretty sweet. So, all the way up at the top, we now have one kill to one. Again, also in terms of builds, Battered Assault is now in, in this case. So it helps a little bit against Samuro, of course, as well. Two Thirsting Blade as a level 4 choice. But yeah, with Ultralist just spawning all of those copies, you can definitely use that level 1 ability. It takes a bit away from uh, the Unending Hatred plays that we've seen so far and with most Illidan players, as you can just stack into the late game and get really murderous damage out there. But it definitely helps you in this one-on-one -on -one against Samuro and also throughout the big team fights later on in the match. And I think we're going to see some synergy picks on top of that, of course, too. So they're continuing to put pressure onto the bottom four. This is really the main goal with Sylvanas in now. It is taking damage. And since level 7 isn't ready yet for Abatha, it also means no mule. So there's no mule available any longer. Uh, well, not yet. So now is the chance to take that fort out. Wait for the next minion wave, push again. But the blue team knows that. So they are throwing everything that they have against them in order to ensure that exactly that doesn't happen. I mean, good luck with this. Top side, the attack continues, and Lopaka is really trying to get the damage in against Ultralisk here. So yeah, they're more or less evenly matched, 
There is, of course, the Abathur factor, and Abathur just doesn't respect 1v1s. So he is going to help out at the top, and that's the one thing that Illidan has probably to be the most careful about, because it is a, a massive pain when you think, all right, boys, I got this. I've won the one-on-one -on -one match against my opponent, and then the first thing that just happens is that they're just saying, you know what? Um, yeah, that's not going to be a thing, because there is this little slugger, and he's going to help out now with some damage, some shield, so good luck dealing with any of this. So, yes. Not gonna happen. Either way, for now, the fight over the camp. Illidan low, falls and wants him and doesn't get him. Shut down, baby. Lurking arm, Samuro is dead too. Yep, this is Team Ash again in the driver's seat. It was a real cool attack and Falstead got a bit too greedy. He thought that he could just fly over and take Illidan down. Illidan with a self-heal and then Stukov helping him too. That leaves them at the top with a real good attack. And off we go. Level 10 abilities are going to be next, and then we're going to see what exactly Avatar is going to do. But right now, things are not really flowing for uh, the blue team. They haven't lost the bottom fort yet, so that's the good news. They can use Mule in order to uh, repair it back up to full HP. The first seed is now also on the map. But they definitely need to control this a bit better. If the idea is to go full macro and then leverage monstrosity instead of copy, they can do that. But then they have to really shine in the macro department from here on out. And they're already behind in experience. They're already behind by an entire level. And that matters. That definitely has an impact. So, here we go. Slide for Masquerade. They're attempting to apply pressure on Sylvanas. They killed bishops before. They're looking for it again. And there's the waves. This book is already in. Mule is not in play any longer. And this Ford is not getting any healthier. But they're still pushing them back. So decent reaction, but level 10 is kicking in, and that is where things stop for them. So, level 10 abilities, everybody. Let's see what they can do with that. Already the push up towards the middle. Level 10 kicks in. That gives us, so far, no surprises. Illidan, I guess the hunt would be a really nice tool for him to have some global presence. The f bottom fort finally falls. Since they have heroic abilities, the blue team can't react to it anymore. And that's the only decision that makes sense for Team Ash. Drop the fort, take it down, and yeah, try and do a little bit more damage in the middle of the map before your opponent gets heroic abilities themselves. Sylvanas is already moving in. The rest is following. Unlikely. Well, maybe they can take it out. I was thinking that most likely it's not going to be the case. But any kind of damage it can do here is already a win. So, yeah. They drop it low. Love at level 10 is now coming in. And Abathar takes the monstrosity. Monty is in the house. We have a bounty attempt. So, Abathar is used... Oh, a wall is already out? Ah, uh, you, should, you should talk to Tazada. He knows how to build a wall. I mean, just ask the Donald. He's been hiring him time and time again. So, Abathar is now going uh, for Monty. Hazo Ops, can he play this a little bit better than what we've seen from Yazu the other game? Because Yazu wasn't really sure how to play the monstrosity, I tell you that much. It felt like a wasted ult for sure. Hazo Ops at least is getting a bit more value out of this. So yeah, way more control for him. Can still help the rest of the team out. But now, perfect positioning also for the monstrosity. Still doing damage here, picking up some stacks. And now we have an RTS master playing the game. Yeah, Hazo actually played a game in the small uh, Stormgate tournament that I hosted against Fan. That was kind of fun. So Fan against Hazo. If you haven't seen that series yet, the two of them playing Stormgate against each other, it's on my second YouTube channel that's linked in the description. And it was kind of funny to see that as a, as a match. Even though Fan had a bit of an upper hand with more experience in, in Stormgate, which is obviously still in development. But you can tell with Hazu that he comes from an RTS background. Every time he plays Vikings with a monstrosity too. But Abathar, no! <laughs> now Illidan died. Illidan died and Falset was lost. So to be fair, this was still a fairly decent trade. The slug was taken out, but they traded it well. And the monstrosity is nearly fully stacked at the bottom and it got killed now because he can't control it. But this was still a pretty okay trade, all things considered. The monstrosity did some work at the bottom of the map. Abathar got eliminated. And yeah, now it is still, I mean, five kills to three. Pretty even. Nobody has taken a seat yet either. Abathar is now helping out uh, Rhaegar with the first two camps here. 
But that bot lane got still pushed out by the monstrosity, so that allowed them to take bot lane control. And that's all that you want to do. You want to poke your opponent, you want to pin them down, you want to get lane control, and they're doing that. They have one global with false dead, they have Samoro, and then they have Abatha. So all of them working together can do a lot here. But yeah, pretty sweet also to try and make that move against Abatha and take him on. Hazel has to be super careful how he positions there. He now gets so much transference, and that is a big upgrade. Not only for Monty, also for Zamoro, for everyone that they want to use with this. Good stacks for Cassia. 43, 9 minutes in. It's damn solid. So yeah, that's great for them. And the attacks here, they keep coming with Lopaka. Yeah, making his move, but Zamoro gets another structure destroyed. Moves in top side once again. Abathar with 14 seconds until the monstrosity is back. And only one seed has been taken so far. One seed by Team Ash. Lopaka Gust! Oh, Illidan gusted into a corner, into a fountain, and then gets killed. So yes, he's dead too. They lost two heroes in the process though. They lost Rega, who never got his ancestral properly through, and they also lost Mei. It is a continuous back and forth between these two teams right now. I mean, yes, they are definitely going for it. And Abatha is now using the monstrosity down at the bottom of the map, trying to deal with the siege giants, and to take that on while the rest of the team is dealing with the middle. But another fort gets lost at the top, so this is two forts that are now gone. And there's obviously a couple of different aspects to all of this. First of all, you're getting more control on the map. Yeah, monstrosity actually moving topside now in order to defend this. I think Yasuo did not know that you could do that. At least he's never done it when he played the monstrosity. But yes, you can tunnel between lanes. So Monte is back in action up at the top. And Haas is doing what he can to take both of these things down. And he's actually doing extremely well dealing with the mercenary camps here. That leaves the rest of the team in a position where they can defend the middle. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about how the forts being destroyed is good for Illidan because the distance to safety for the opponent's team just grows and that is always bad because Illidan loves, he thrives on chaos and he thrives also on the distance. Chasing down opponents is what he does. Monty is on 25 stacks, Abatha with a mule in the middle and Hazo is still taking care of the monstrosity. Still doing work over here. Yep, and well... He is already on 30 stacks. Gets a few more hit points back. And can of course now play around this. Samuro is even coming topside to help out. So he might move Monstrosity down to the bottom of the map. But uh, Team Ash is not just sitting there taking all of this. They are attacking. They are pushing. They are taking another fort out in the middle. So structurally they are getting more and more ahead. The idea of the blue team is to play a macro game. And they have now on level 16 as is their opponent. Blades of Azenoth. So nice synergy with level 1, 4, uh, sorry, level 1, 7 and level 16. But the attacks are in. Monty tunnels and escapes. Bottom of the map. Also still has to be a bit careful that he doesn't lose it. But it's now fully stacked and this is starting to do some damage. They are still losing their fights though. May is down, Falset is down, so you can do a lot of damage on the map if you're just moving from one lane to another. And it's proven down here, but Monstrosity, the Monstrosity is probably going to be taken out. But this is damage at the fort that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. <laughs> this is decent damage in the fight too. But they're starting to lose the game. Nine kills to four, half a level behind. Sylvanas is too powerful on these structures. Metamorphosis used to escape. And, well, let's see. There's the objective. It's not looking great for the Bartwurz boys. The idea is solid. The thought process here is not bad by any means, but it, they're just not... It's just not working. Because Team Ash is forcing... First of all, Team Ash has Sylvanas. So they can go and push structures just so much faster than the blue team can. And they're also winning the fights. They're being forced into fights they don't want to take. They have trouble getting the objective which means that we now have Garden Terrors. So the team that wants to dominate the map and wants to play the macro game is pinned down in their base and gets consistently pushed with Sylvanas just murdering everything with the help of Illidan and others. So, yeah, it's tough. Ice Wall is out. Try and gust into a wall attempt a bit. Abatha, I mean, again, they have Mule, but that only helps you so much. If you're getting this heavily attacked and you're just losing ground, basically everywhere, then how are you going to deal with that? So it's it's a tough time for uh, the bathroom boys, for the Bratwurst boys. Yeah, I mean, right now, the one and a half level lead essentially for Team Ash. They are heavily ahead. 
And th since they took all of the forts out, it also means that they have a huge experience gain passively that is now tickling in. I mean, you can see the experience gains right here. It's not only on the heroes where they had. Look at the mercenary gap. Mercenary experience the gap there is massive. They make up for it with minions a bit, and that's also where Abathon Monstrosity, of course, helps out. But passive experience is another issue. Structures is the big issue. And it's just a continuous barrage of attacks from Team Ash that's being executed in nearly every single lane. Now, Abathon is up at the top. Has the monstrosity. We'll have to move it back a little bit because it's going to take over in just a moment. Which shouldn't really be an issue. It's currently only on 8 stacks, so not all that powerful. It's actually not too bad. Only Catapult is currently aiming for it, and Hazo is already macroing it as best as he can. But it doesn't change the fact that they have to defend, 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 defend. This is essentially the game they're playing right now. And Team Ash is moving from camp to camp and establishes more pressure on those lanes. And now they try to lock the monstrosity down. Hazu can try to tunnel out, I guess. But yeah, that's a no on that. Uh, tunnels and is at the bottom of the map. I was actually thinking it would go into the Nexus or something, but no. So our next seed is coming up. Illidan is defending the top side so that the fort doesn't fall. At the bottom, they're trying to set the monstrosity in play, but Mitra is already there. Every time they're pushing, the answer is there. Team Ash is having all the answers now. And that's another seed that they're going to pick. So, uh, when are you going to take some forts out? Each camp that gets claimed by the red team is another setback. And Cassia is stacking. Cassia is currently at 80 stacks. Look at Dino. That's what I meant when I said distance to safety. He barely makes it. He meets Illidan on the map and barely makes it out of the fight alive. 35,000 for Sylvanas. 32,000 for Cassia now. And... Yeah, it is tough times. Down at the bottom of the map, the attack is already coming. We have, in the meantime, the push going through the middle. And, yeah, let's see. This is the keep. This is the first keep. And it's not looking good for the Bratwurst boys. It's looking very good for the audience. Because this might just well be a 3 mapper. There's a big chance of that happening. So, yep. 21 against 19. Here's the big play for keep number two as we have the core already getting attacked. If they can get kills now, it's over. And there's May gone. May is gone and it's all falling apart right here. It's all falling apart. Look how much pressure there is already. Absolutely crazy. So, yep, nicely done. So with that, we're looking at four kills to 10 and we're going into game number three. Team Ash against the Bratwurst boys. The series goes the distance and Monty unfortunately once again loses a game. GG, well played. Game number three, Tomb of the Spider Queen. So the bounty with Monty failed. To be fair, it kind of felt that the entire draft failed a little bit for them. Sylvanas was just so powerful against Abatha and the strategy that they were attempting to use there. And it wrecked them. Let's be honest, it just wrecked them. So now that we're heading in game, into game number three, we'll see if they can now bring it back. I mean, again, the loser of this series drops down into the final match of the day, the final match of the group, the consolation match, and the winner already moves on to the next round of the tournament, which is obviously the top four playing a double elimination system, as I explained earlier. So, are we going to get any more bounties, or now that we're in game number three, are the two teams just saying, like, yeah, this is a little bit too, too risky. Now, we get Medivh, and Team Ash, I never know if Team Ash is like frustrated with some of these things. It's a little bit weird, but if you look at map number one, I'm not saying Team Ash had it in the bag, but they were definitely the ones making the moves. They were the ones just dictating the pace of the game, and then they made one wrong decision, thought they could end the game, and it backfired, allowed the Bratwurst boys to get back, and then they just took it. So there's an argument to be made that Team Ash could have won this series already, with a 2-0, which hasn't happened, but yeah. As it is, we're going to game number three. I'm not going to complain about it. Like, we get a third map and I'm absolutely on board with it. 20 heroes cannot be played again. 
the 20 heroes that you have already seen. So we want to make things a little bit more entertaining for people. But the question is still, is one of the teams going for a bounty? Is anybody going to bounty it up on the map? And there's of course plenty of things that you can do on Tomb of the Spider Queen. <laughs> it's kind of funny that Varian is getting banned. Uh, but yeah, sniper comms are of course still possible. Unless they wanted to go for Meme Blades Varian. That is a bounty. I'm pretty sure we're going to see that eventually. Not Varian played as a main tank and then you drop Meme Blades in, but Varian being played as a side laner and then as a damage dealer. So that could be a thing. I mean, there's a couple of plays that you can technically also make to uh, maybe go for like potential double buy or whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Uther gets banned too. This is always the interesting part for me because now we're really on the last map, right? Is a team gonna play with a handicap and go for a bounty? Yes or no? That's the big one. Now, Kerrigan gets picked. That already means that when we're talking about potential team bounties, that you would have to go for a StarCraft comp. I can already tell you right now, I just don't believe in this. Especially since we are in game three. I believe like the farther we go in a series, the harder it's also for a team to pull off one of these like team compositions, like a Warcraft comp or like an Alliance comp, Horde comp, Starcraft, Overwatch comp. This is something that essentially you have to do in game number one, maybe game number two. I mean, really just over the last couple of games, like thinking way too much also about the bounty meta and what you could do. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the teams are both shying away from a bounty and just saying like, yeah, let's not do that. Let's just play it safe and try and win the game here. Because again, this would give you not only a ticket straight into the finals, into the final round, but it would also give you a very good seat for it. So you would have a much, much easier opponent. Now, uh, Brightwing, Leo... Carrigan. Good control for Hazops at the bottom. Ultralisk with Carrigan. They banned uh, my F out. That would have been another really good pick for them. But yeah. And well, time will tell. There's Diablo. Okay, so they they banned the OG bully. Diablo is always ready to stuff some nerds into lockers. But what's the final ban here? Are they going to try and ban our Drenella bishops? I honestly don't think we're going to get a bounty here. Not the way this series has been going. It was way too close for that. I'm already surprised that they even attempted it in game number two. But that's obviously, as I said, in my opinion, the way the, the map where you try and make it happen. Yeah, so they ban against Renella. They ban Lucio. And... Yeah, now the big question. Next double pick. Junkrat for interrupts is great. Did they combo anything off with Garrosh? You could obviously try. I mean, you could even go Zarya Garrosh. Most of a thing normally for Braxis, for Battlefield of Eternity, but we've seen it here. Marthale and Anna. Nano boosted Marthale. We could actually get that with Torment and Souls. So depending on what their last pick is for bishops, that could be a thing. They still need a side laner, so that's the big one. And with Dino and Masquerade coming together. <laughs> the one thing I could have seen is somebody pick a Cho'Gal here. Maybe. But yeah, I don't think so. Tassada and Anubarak. Tassada is an interesting one. That's a choice that I didn't see necessarily coming. So yeah, more control. With Anubarak dropping Cocoon, dropping the stuns. And that gives us bishops as the final pick. So, ladies and gentlemen, toe-to-toe -to -toe here. We are in the playoffs. We are in Group A. The winner moves on to the top four. And we get Imperius as the final pick. Team Ash, ladies and gentlemen, going up against the Bratwurst Boys. The final map, game number three. On the left, Nuburak, played by Masquerade, Death Knight on Brightwing, Hazobs with Leoric, we got Ultralisk on Carrigan, and Dino is playing Tassada. On the right side of the map, Team Ash can combo quite a bit here. We have Renella playing Ana, could drop a nano boost on Lopaka, for example, who plays Malthel here. Even a combo with um, the thingy. Tormented Souls is not out of the question. Maybe a little bit unlikely, but. We've seen it, mostly Infernal Shrines, but it can be a thing. 
Mitra and Junkrat, Bishops and Imperius, and Morenas is playing Garrosh as we're heading into the final map of the series. So, Tassadar with a Cyan Fusion, so he's going straight for the Psionic Storm here. I'm trying to make some moves with that. Now, in addition, we have for Leo, Orson's Renewal, and the Consuming Flame for Imperius. After seeing the strategy a little bit earlier, I think one of the comps and a lot of teams, or a lot of one of the bounties that a lot of teams will probably try and complete, is for example uh, Diablo comp. I think there's some really nice things that you can do with Diablo comps. Definitely some variability, especially around triple frontline picks that you can go for. Oh, the wall is out. So, there's the hit on Bishops, Carrigan with a comp, Death Knight, yeah, a bit low, but he's, no, oh, the hit, they didn't trust, no trust, that could have been a kill, if they believed in Bishops to make that connect, they could have taken Brightwing at least down, maybe more, but Brightwing would have fallen, but apparently they don't believe in, uh, in Bishops, kind of feels bad. He's sad now, and for good reason, because that would have been a pretty epic combo. Alright, so we got the camp over on the left side, already being claimed. Red Team has actually not gone for their own Bruiser camp, they are maybe making a move for the Siege Giants at the bottom of the map, but the Bruiser camp is so far still Gucci. And the attack here, still coming. Mm -hmm. Hazu, alright. Also has to be a bit careful on this. They're trying instead for Morenas. Everybody is just playing around CCs right now. So they're all attempting to lock the target down with a little bit of frontline stuns and then get the kill in. Each team just dancing around each other, waiting for that opportunity that allows them to get some hits in. And both of them are, of course, insanely dangerous right now. Yeah, the attacks, they still keep coming here as they're hoping for a little bit more. Let's see what they can do here. Morena dropping a little bit low. Gotta be careful. And Death Knight is the first one to fall. The Fruit Fly was able to get out of harm's way a little bit earlier today. But at least right now it is the end of Trashwing. So Brightwing is gone. That's one already destroyed. So, so far so good. And can they get a few more hits in? Yes, they can. And that is a second one that falls. Guys, this is getting interesting. So what we're seeing right now is the Bratwurst boys struggling in the early game. They're actually starting to lose some ground here and yeah, nice little lead for their opponents. So let's see what we're getting with this. We have down at the bottom of the map still everyone trying to take a, a bit of a look of what they can do on the bot lane if they can push this out a little bit further as well. But yeah. Not too bad, because right now, this is exactly the kind of place that you're looking for. Get those kills, get a little bit of map control, maybe nice some gems to your opponent, start with your own turn in, and just all in all, try to get a bit of a lead on all of this. So, small lead in experience, small lead in kills, but that already must feel good that in the fi on the final map, we're starting to do some work here. So, can they continue this? Yes, no. Are they going to overreach at some point, as they so often do? All questions that we're going to answer as the game continues. But they are making a play down here at the bottom. Brightwing is trying the same thing. Hazel has 20 gems, so he needs to be very careful. Siege Giants, yep, are taken by the red team. And Hazu is about to go down. Well, they're turning it. They want to go for Lopaka, and Hazu gets away. I mean, even if he died here they would have been able to secure the gems. But Brightwing gets murdered again. I'm always there for that. Only a dead fruit fly is a good fruit fly. That's what I always say. So yeah, Brightwing down. Three kills to zero, half a level advantage. And on top of that, then are also working on the bottom wall. So they're using the Siege Giants to take some of the towers out. Turnins are slowly coming together, but Hazu delivers. And that means Web Weavers for the blue team. Which is actually big, because that relieves a lot of the pressure that they've been experiencing here. Yeah, there's a slow. Is Tazada ready for another wall? Oh, they are ready for a kill. Yeah, they killed Hazu a bit late, so he has already gotten rid of most of his gems. But still, nice to get a kill here. And carry again, Ultralisk. Hobbity hop. Queen of Blades, and nope, that's two kills now against them. Hazel will respawn, but that's bad news. That's Carrigan gone, and that means that you're gonna have a tough time pushing properly. Five kills to zero, by the way. 
I mean, not even talking about the push with the Web Weavers here, but five kills to zero, that is not the start that the Brat Wars boys were looking for. And again, I want to remind everybody that essentially the Brat Wars boys have won every single match that they participated in through all of the qualifiers. And I've been saying over and over again that that's amazing, but at the same time, at the end of the day, it's the playoffs that really matter. So now they have a chance to use those Web Weavers to do some damage, and that kill against Garrosh is coming in quite handy. But this can still backfire. They can still lose some games here, and it would be wild if they would lose, if they would not get number one in the group. After everything that they've done, in the qualifiers to not get number one in the group would be disappointing to them. Now, we're not there yet, and obviously uh, Team Ash is not a pushover by any means, but still. Look at this. Tormented Souls, Nana Boost. Called it. Here it is. Tormented Souls and Nana Boost. That's exactly what we've been expecting. And with level 10 abilities, they invade the opponent's bruiser camp, claim it. Carrigan at least had some space and time at the top to start and go for the wall. But Garrosh is coming in. Morenas goes for stun. The rest of the team is starting to rotate in, but they're gonna be a bit late, are they? No, maybe? Right wing gets attacked again. Riptire! Yeah! Does get destroyed, but the connect happens from bishops, and that is all that they need. Brightwing dies again. They still leverage the level 10 here. By now we have the opponent also with rogue abilities. We get black hole, but the attacks there are coming. Anubura gets caught, 17 gems, and Masquerade gets murdered in a flash. Masquerade goes down, 17 gems gone. We still haven't seen a single turn in for the red team, but they have not only the gems, they've also now taken a position where they are again ahead in experience, ahead in levels. They want to go for Carrigan. Ultralisk is able to escape thanks to Brightwing, and now Bishops has to be careful. You don't want to lose heroes now, but they are making big, big plays now against their opponents. And it definitely shows. Like, this is not, not comfortable for the Bratwurst boys. Not at all. They gotta shut this down early. They gotta stop that momentum that is being built up for Team Ash and start to do their thing. So, uh, yeah. Seven kills to one. That's where we're at right now. But what can they do with it? Bottom wall gets destroyed. I mean, congratulations, but you gotta do a bit more than that. A little bit better. Take those forts on, and they are trying at the top. Riptire is coming in, and they go for Dainu. Bye-bye, Tassada. Tassada is gone, and you can kiss that fort goodbye. At least the top fort is gone, and just looking at the bot lane, they're going to lose at least two here. So, yes, Team Ash is absolutely crushing it. I mean, damn. These guys are on a tear. Call them butter, because they're on a roll right now. Push in the middle. We have Carrigan destroyed. <laughs> They're picking up these kills wherever they fight them. It's ridiculous right now. Guys, this is the first Web Weaver wave. It is literally the first Web Weaver wave for the red team. They took two forts out. The one in the middle is nearly destroyed. There's still plenty of gems in the hands of uh, Team Ash. And on top of that, we now have them with a level 13 talent advantage and they can make a play for boss which they're already setting up. So bot lane pressure has been established. In the middle, the fort is nearly gone and they're just dropping them one hero at a time. They're going wild on this. Boss is about to be taken. I don't even know if the blue team is A, aware of it. They probably are. But if they're willing to fight into this, even if they knew. 20,000 damage for Junkrat, 15,000 for Tassadar. The boss is definitely going to be claimed. And they are in possession of enough gems for another turn in. A newsflash, the blue team isn't. Blue team doesn't have enough gems. So, yeah, good luck with that, even if you're trying to turn some of the shit in. So, right now, this is getting tougher and tougher by the minute for uh, the Bratwurst boys. I think at this point, it's only a matter of time until Team Ash is overestimating their position and YOLOs and loses everything. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. They have to be a bit careful, though, with the decision-making, obviously. Because if you are that far ahead, if you're playing such a great game, you can oftentimes be your worst opponent and they just can't get too greedy. It's always that balance that you have to rock between not being too greedy but also not letting your opportunities just simply slide away from you. That top boss is not getting uh, dealt with, by, so yeah, it's gonna do damage here. And they have another set of web weavers, as I already said. So they can use those too. And yeah, I think we're gonna get that. Another delivery, Tassada! And Tassa nicht mehr da. 
So, yeah, that's another kill. That's a fort destroyed. And again, they have just now turned in and they are dominating all the lanes. They're dominating every single lane and they're getting level 16 soon. It's half a level, a bit more than half a level that they need until they have it. They're looking so damn good here. It's an absolute stomp. Up to here, it's been a stomp. 10 kills to 1. We're talking Bratwurst Boys, the team that won every qualifier they participated in. Finally, Anna at least gets killed. Carrigan gets a hook on Anna and takes her down. But Leo is dead too. Masquerade is in trouble. And with trouble, I mean he's dead. So that's two heroes gone. They get level 16 talents. And yeah, can they take a keep down? Probably not. Can they start breaking those walls? Do a bit more? I mean, definitely. So yeah, two levels ahead, 10 kills ahead, making the plays and just breaking through everything they can here. Taking walls down, taking, uh, taking opponents wherever there presents an opportunity. And it's just a matter of opening the game up for bigger plays later on. And that's what they're trying to do here. So Alopaka, careful again, you gotta keep those gems at the top, the wall is open, in the middle it has been opened up and down at the bottom of the map we're seeing more or less the same thing here. So they're getting there. They wanna steal the camp away and with level 16 talents there's no reason why they shouldn't. Ana is back, 30,000 damage by Junkrat, camp is about to be taken, Hazu, there's the wall, yeah they were trying to trap him, couldn't, put the lid on a little bit too late. So now the chance to push into the middle. And look at this, Ultralisk is trying to sneak the turn in just to make sure that his team has a chance to properly defend here. They're going again for Hazu. Yeah, they can't get the kill, but they can push him back. And the hope was to get some damage in on uh, the mid keep. But they now can move towards the top and defeat the Web Weavers once that they touch ground. But th the blue team is at least making good moves in an attempt to come back into this. So we gotta give him that. They are down every single fort. They have still keep standing. This is their first turn in, so there's not a lot of good things to say about it. But they're closing in on level 16, which is good. They just need to start getting some kills. They need to win some of these fights. Coordinate them well around the CC trains of Anubarak and Carrigan. Top web weavers are already down here in the middle. I think it's also going to be easily defeated. Maybe down at the bottom of the map they can get some structural damage. I don't think they can really take out uh, a fort yet necessarily. But who knows, with a kill they could. Masquerade low and there's the cocoon on Malthale as he was murdering them. Absolutely destroying them with tormented souls. Now they lose in addition to Brightwing, also Leoric. At least at the bottom of the map, the Web Weavers are doing damage, so that's the good news. But yeah, there's very little of that to go around for them. They're just losing way too much here. Way too much. And I'm talking uh, blue team, obviously. L losing that one for two years. If they can turn in now, they got 63 gems, then they can set up the next big hit. And we are talking, of course, also level 20. Let's not forget about that. They're getting closer and closer to level 20 as well. And that storm talent gap that they're going to establish is going to be big. This is not a tiny gap that we're talking about. They're currently basic. They're more than two levels ahead. Is what's happening here. More than two levels. That's nasty. So, yeah. They're already trying to deliver some of the gems. They control the flow of the game. And the blue team realizes that they have to do something now. The Bratwurst boys have to do something. And that might be the kill. That one's great. Good in Tomb 2. They have still a lot of gems here. Can they recover a bit more? Morena's is still safe, but that was a big one. That was a huge kill. And now they have momentum. Now they have momentum and they use it at the top of the map in order to take that fort out. So finally, finally some light at the end of the tunnel. Carrigan is already going for boss. They're realizing that they should make a play now. And in addition, Morena's is now turning in. So Web Weavers are coming in. Damage at the bottom of the map is going to be there. And they're already moving in for the bottom keep. So yes, those Web Weavers are going to be in play. But maybe they can even go for that keep. The red team has to react to this. And they got to react quickly to it. So they're trying. But yeah, Web Weavers are going to be in. And this is Siege Giants plus Web Weavers at the bottom of the map. They should try and make a move. Boss has now been claimed. They know that there's a lot of heroes at the top. But the defense is ready. There's even a push in the middle coming with Web Beaver. So yes, those keeps are taking damage. But how are they going to react? Malthale is back. But what can they do with this objective? I don't think they're going to do anything with it. I think they could have done way more. 
It honestly seems like they weren't quite sure if the boss was being attacked or not, because if they knew that they had more of a time window, they could have used it, I believe, to take the keep nearly out. But they can defend at the top, don't even have to. They still control the lanes, of course, which is nice, and now they have level 20, which is basically their biggest asset. But eventually, they have to also do something with that. It's nice if you're ahead in the game, but this is exactly what I said earlier. In game number one, their problem was that they were a bit too greedy. They misjudged the situation and thought they could end and were quickly proven wrong. But now they got to do at least some damage. You can't let... If you're in a position like this and you let the Bratwurst boys get to level 20 without taking at least a keep down, then you've definitely screwed up. Uh, it's easier said than done, obviously. I mean, it's just like, you know, uh, armchair experts, hi, but still. You need to use that talent advantage. It's a big gap. It was a two-level gap initially. They got the turn in, and now they have to try and at least eliminate one of those keeps. What else are you fighting for? Because if you don't do that and your opponent gets to level 20, you're on high level again. So what happens to those big advantages that you were running earlier? So yeah, they have to wait for the next minion wave and try and get that done. They are slowly poking it out. Good for them. They're just not getting enough gems for anything. And kudos to the Bratwurst boys. They're defending. Again, earlier they had only keep standing and hadn't even killed a fort yet. Now there's only one more fort standing and they're closing the experience gap slowly and steadily. So, yeah. They try to trap Garrosh. There's the stun. Where are the heals? No, Garrosh! Oh, he's dead. Can they get the counter kill? Yes! Uh, Nuburag is dead too, uh, and he lost a lot of gems here. They went for Azu, they explode, they go for Dino, and he somehow still survives, but Brightvane gets killed. This is the chance. No, they're losing Marseille. But he can buy back, and he did buy back. The keep in the middle is gone. Keep in the middle is gone. There's the play. Now what are they going to do with it? It's still four versus three. They go bot side, and they're trying to get more damage in against the bottom keep too. They have to be careful that they don't overstay, that they don't sitting here for too long. But this is exactly what they can do. I mean, right here, right now, while you still have 20 seconds until a Nubrak is back, look for another kill, look to see if you can get something done, and Tomb upgraded, and Imperius is alive, and Hasu died. They go for Ultralisk, he's still alive and kicking. Bot lane gets attacked. Yep, there's the minions, there's the catapults, and that is the second keep that falls. Now they need to decide whether they want to stay longer, and they shouldn't, because Brightwing is back in six seconds, Nubra can force the fight with Cocoon, Hazu can respawn, of course, a bit faster than other heroes, and once that he drops his and tomb, it's also going to be a big, big problem. But this is not a bad spot for uh, Team Ash to be in. The Bratwurst boys, they did a great job, as I said earlier, to try and defend for as long as they possibly could, and they did a really sweet job. But now, this was exactly what Team Ash needed to establish, again, a dominant position in all of this. What can the blue team do now? They have not enough gems for a turn in. Neither does I have the red team. So, neither one. But, yeah, that's gonna get super interesting now. Because we are 19 minutes in. Catapults hurt. That bot in that mid lane, they're gonna hurt. 56,000 damage for uh, Junkrat. And on top of that, we have Malthel at 43,000, also not too bad. Whereas the top damage dealer is Tassadar for the blue team, and he's, he's only, only sitting at 41,000. So, yeah, working on those potential turn ins. Boss also up soon, TM. If they. If th this is a good news also for the red team now. If they just posture around boss, then you are in a spot where your opponent has to react. You don't commit, but their bot lane is pushing against them because of catapults. Oh, my Damn, son! He's still alive! That looked bad for a moment, but he's still alive. What about Imperius? There's the rip tire, and. Yeah, he gets a bit of damage in. But they are just exchanging blows and damage, but nobody has been killed yet. But that could happen now. Yep, that's the end of Marthael. Did he have? And no! <laughs> are the Broadwurst boys really bringing it back like this? My try is gone. They can't get a counter kill. Unbelievable. These guys, it's just crazy. How are they bringing this game back? 
This should not happen. Renella with a nice sleep dart and he's getting away. Hazu does not have an entomb. They're chasing hard. Ultralist. Everything gets dodged. <laughs> Renella, you go on. And he still dies. He's the Juke Master 2000 and he still falls. They're going to try for the boss. They're going to try for boss and then set a death push off. Aren't they? I mean, Brightwing, Morenas is still alive. 20 seconds for Imperius. The chase was long. But once that the boss is taken, we're 20 minutes in. They don't have the gems to turn in. Well, they have 12, but they can't. Tur they, they don't get a turn in, like a full turn in. So, yeah. This is getting awkward. Nice dodge. Fantastic dodge here. Inevitable end to dodge the cocoon. Which was awesome, but he still gets caught. Why? Like, why? 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 Why are you guys there? Why are you dying? What's the reason to be there? I don't understand them sometimes. I love Team Ash to death, but it's moves like this where I'm just thinking, what were you trying to do? Why was that necessary? Three heroes down, that's game. That's just game. Like, uh, at least it's gonna make things even. I mean, Malthael even, look at this play. Malthael even dodges the cocoon, but then there's so much stun and they die. It's insane. Like, you don't need to be there. You don't need to do that. I mean, where else are they going to be? I think we missed the cocoon, the inevitable bend there. But now the top keeps gone. The catapults are still, of course, a massive issue. And yeah, Hazu needs to retreat because catapults are going to be on the core in a moment. And we're 22 minutes in. So, yeah, he needs to deal with this or the core would take damage. I mean, it is already going to take a little bit of damage. Those catapults are definitely going to break through the shield. But it's not going to end the game. So, yeah, he's there. Core goes down to 80%. But now the boss comes in. They can defend with 5, but now it's not just a boss play. It's boss plus web weavers. And those web weavers down here, they are helping 77% on the core. Team Ash is just, it's an enigma. I mean, it's both of them. It's the comeback capabilities of the blue team, but it's also the fact that Team Ash is just overdoing it sometimes. Leo isn't there, so they're trying to go for a play. They want to go for Nuburak, and a noob is alive. Kerrigan is dead. That's a good start. Kerrigan dying is a great start. So they're trying to get some kills here, but at some point they got to shift over to defense. And I think that's what they're going to do right now. Boss is already on the core, so they have to try and stop this. And it's not going to be easy by any means. The attacks are still in. Lopaka gets stunned. And the Bratwurst boys decide that they're going to move back here. This is not over yet. <laughs> it is such a wild game. It's such a crazy series. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now we have 77% on the core against, well, 63 Two keeps against one keep. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, they weren't able to end. Even with that, they were weren't able to end. If Kerrigan doesn't fall, I think it's game. I mean, look at the 63% of the core. If Kerrigan doesn't die this quickly, then I think it's just lights out. But yeah, really awesome fights that we have from the two now. I mean, again, obviously mistakes made. It's easier also like to talk about it and to be in the game yourself, right? So backseat gaming is always a lot easier than anything else. But at the same time, it wouldn't be that insane and that entertaining if we didn't see mistakes on both sides. I think that Team Ash could have done much better there with some of the decisions that they made, but they still, they still are in the game. That in and of itself is something. So next team fight is likely going to decide the outcome of this game. The next big team fight, the next few kills. <laughs> Talking turn-ins? Uh, maybe we're seeing another set of web weavers. But we now have 26 gems to deliver, 27 on the other side, 17 gem lead. It's likely going to be about the team fight. Yeah, Bishop is already jumping in, trying to get some damage out. There is still more lane control for the red team, simply because of the fact that they have the extra, the extra structures destroyed. So yeah. But yeah, let's see how far they can go with this. I mean, the attacks are already coming over here. 12 to 18 kills. 30 kills in total. Well, the attacks continue. They're trying to catch. The Parker has done tons of damage throughout the game. So has Junkrat, of course. Not only Mouthile. 
top side, still a bit of a thorn. Careful, boys. Catapults, 25 minutes in. You know that hurts. Ah, he misses. Misses the ult. And Hazu responds immediately, but a little bit too late. Good reaction. Kerrigan in trouble. Kerrigan! Oh, well. Actually, Balsai at first in trouble. And Uberak dead. Is this it? Is this it? Catapults on the core nearly, but look at Maltail! Maltail is going ham, dodges the ult from Tassadar, he nearly has ultralis there. They're turning in on Maltail and he's dead! Kerrigan, can she survive? She can, but Leo is likely gonna fall, no! And Maltail bought back. So, they got a kill against the Nuvorak, but what are they gonna do with it? They can't go for the core anymore. They can turn in some gems. They have 40 gems now. That gets them very close to a turn in. And they could push out the top lane. Boss is not up for another minute. And Nuburag is back in 29 seconds. So yes, they're turning in everything that they have right now. Which is exactly what they should do. But <laughs> damn, this game is so wild. <laughs> and they're also attempting to set up a trap. But yeah, this was pretty big. Yeah, Nubarak is back in 10. Yes, Cocoon. You can use Inevitable End and Indomitable as much as you want, but careful. They, they, they can turn in now. This is the Webweaver Wave. Right here, this is the objective. This is the big objective. 27 minutes into the game. They want the Siege Giants as well as it seems. No, nope, they're already moving back. But yeah, there's the turn in. Junkrat has it. <sighs> Now or never, guys, I don't know. Can the blue team defend again? Can they actually do it? Can they defend this once again? They need a quick kill if they want to, I feel. They're going for the fight. Oh, Garrosh! Garrosh is alive! Garrosh is alive and Kerrigan is in trouble. She wants to kill on Renella. She doesn't get it! Kerrigan down, Hansel down. This has to be it. Web Weavers on the ground. This is the moment. Dino is about to fall. Spray game is in. It's a triple, baby. And this is the end of the Bathro boys. This is the first series that they're losing in the Banshee Cup. Insane. They're in the playoffs. They've dominated the qualifiers. Actually, I don't... Is it the first series? I don't even know anymore. I think it is. I might be wrong. Who cares? 22 kills to 13. Team Ash has absolutely done it. They've caused the first upset. They defeated the big favorite in the group stage. They leave the group as the number one team. And the Bratwurst boys have to go down into the consolation match. GG and well done.